Happy New Year, Cornerstone. I am so glad that you are ringing the new year, the first Sunday of 2021 with us as we get to gather and worship. I know we're scattered in so many different places, but we are gathered together for a purpose. And that purpose is to worship God for who he is and for what he has done. And we worship God as the one who is our confidence. He is the one who is our hope. And he is the one who is fully trustworthy of everything. And so we get to go into this year with that kind of confidence. No matter what happens, no matter the circumstances, we can rest in the the sureness of who God is. And so we're here to celebrate him, to make much of him in everything that we do, from the singing, from the prayers that we offer, to the sermon that is preached, the word that is proclaimed, his word that has the power to transform us, our hearts, and our lives. And so we're here together to worship him for who he is and what he's done. Well, I'm grateful that we get to spend this time together, that we get to worship him together. I wanna tell you about really one thing, and it's this. We have a, a new missions drive for January. We are asking you to bring food in for the um, New Hope Food Pantry. And uh, many of you have helped there and have already given, but here's what has happened over the last year. Because of the pandemic, their shelves are running low. And so here we get the opportunity at the beginning of the year to just fill those shelves. So here's what you can do. You can go to our lobby and pick up a bag and fill those bags up with lots of items and then bring those back. We will have a no contact drop off on Saturday, January 30th from 9 a.m. to 11 a.m. And so if you're more comfortable doing that, you can mark your calendars and be a part of that. But this is just another way for us to be the hands and the feet of Jesus and to serve in a very, very practical way to restock the shelves of the New Hope Food Pantry. And so would you consider being a part of that and giving towards that? Well, we're starting a new series and we're calling it Bold Faith Part 2. And the reason we're doing that is because we're actually continuing through the book of Romans or the chapter of Romans we were in earlier, which is Romans 12 where Paul practically lays out the implications of the gospel, of when we've encountered the mercy of God, the love of God, we then live it out. And we live it out with bold faith. And so this is a sequel you're not going to want to miss. We want to continue in this. We want to be people who are defined by a bold faith, a bold love. Listen to what Oswald Chambers says. He says this, Faith never knows where it is being led, but it loves and knows the one who is leading Isn't that great? As we head into this new year, we know the one who is leading us. We know that we can trust him. We know that he is our confidence. And so we go into this new year with that assurance. And so let's call one another in to worship. I'll begin and then together we'll respond. Lord Jesus, the author and perfecter of our faith, we come to give you thanks and praise your name. We come to worship you the one who is our beginning, fulfillment, and completion. Lord Jesus, our rock and our strength, our trust is not in the things of this world, but in who you are and what you have done. We come to praise and thank you, who is forever faithful, loyal, and trustworthy. Lord Jesus, the foundation of our hope, you are the answer to all our fears, struggles, and our anxieties. This new year, we seek to love you with all our heart, soul, mind, and strength. Grant us bold faith as we worship your holy name together.
Well, we worship the one who is holy. He is holy and yet he is merciful. He is holy and perfect and pure. And he is the source of all that is good. And yet he reached down to us, broken in our sinfulness. And he's redeemed us. And he's brought us back into a relationship with him so that we can know him and love him and follow him. And so we can actually be reconciled with him and we can be reconciled with one another. That's the good news. That's the gospel. That's what we get to celebrate as we move in to this new year together. And so would you pray with me? Heavenly Father, we thank you that you are a God who is great, a God who is mighty and strong, a God who is sovereign, that there is no detail that is out of your control. You hold all things in your hand. Father, we know that to be true, but we don't know, we don't understand it fully. There's so much about that that we can't grasp with our finite minds because you are infinite. But we ask that you would help us to rest and to trust in your good purposes. So we are thankful for a new year. We're thankful that we get to step into it together as a body of believers, as, as your people. And we pray that you would lead us into this new year. Help us to grow in our love for you. Help us to grow in our love for one another. We know that that doesn't come natural to us because of the sin that is in our hearts. But you have come to rescue us from our sin. You have come to make us more and more like Jesus. And so we pray you would do that. Would you do that in our lives together? Teach us through your word. We pray for Sheldon as he opens up your word. We ask that you would move in a powerful way by the power of your spirit. Apply your word to our hearts so that your word would be lived out in our lives. And so we ask all of these things in the name of the one who taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. It's great to have you join us as we begin a new year together. We have just spent the last five weeks focusing on the coming of Christ and the love of Christmas. And I hope you've come to a greater understanding of the meaning and power of Christmas. Our Savior traveled from the wood of a manger to the wood of a cross for us to remedy our condition and to display the extravagant love of God for his people. When you are redeemed by the Savior of the world, he changes you forever. We become swamped by the grace of God, and we are never the same again. We are radically different, and we now belong to the kingdom of God. This was the message that Paul was teaching the Roman Christians. The salvation that Jesus brings to us is not just the forgiveness of sins. Salvation produces the total transformation of who we are. We become a new creation, a workmanship for God, and he gives us a new purpose and a new way of life because he now lives in us. Salvation begins the work of God within us, molding us day by day into the likeness of Jesus. Because of this, the Apostle Paul was teaching the Romans how to live out their newborn faith boldly in the midst of the unbelief all around them. Let me remind you of Paul's teaching from Romans 12. He said, let love be genuine, abhor what is evil, hold fast to what is good, love one another with brotherly affection, outdo one another in showing honor, and do not be slothful in zeal, be fervent in spirit, and serve the Lord. Rejoice in hope, be patient in tribulation, be constant in prayer, and contribute to the needs of the saints and seek to show hospitality. Bless those who persecute you, bless and do not curse them. Well, we could never accomplish this way of living on our own. 
But when Jesus takes a hold of us, Paul said, it is no longer I who live, but Christ lives in me. Because of the grace of God, we can love genuinely. We can hate evil and hold to that which is good. We can be patient in the struggles and the suffering of this world and even rejoice in the midst of sorrow because Christ lives in us. Paul Tripp wrote that wonderful devotional called New Morning Mercies, and he helps us understand this. He said, as amazing as the grace of forgiveness and the acceptance of God are, there is still more amazing grace to this story. God knew that the dilemma of our sin was such a deep personal moral disaster that it was not enough to forgive us. That forgiveness should never be minimized, but God knew we needed more. He knew that after our forgiveness and acceptance, we would need daily, daily help. He knew that we would need rescue and strength and wisdom and deliverance. So he didn't just forgive us. He didn't just accept us. He came to us and made us the place where he dwells. That's why Paul says, it's no longer I who live, but Christ lives in me. I don't think that we talk about this enough. I don't think that we celebrate this reality enough. I don't think we let our hearts consider the wonder of this identity enough. By grace, we are the temple of the Most High God. By grace, He lives in us. By grace, His power is at our disposal. By grace, He fights on our behalf, even if we don't have the sense to do so. And by grace, He works within us to complete the labor of grace that He has begun. By grace, he animates us to desire to do what is right. By grace, he exposes us and convicts us. We are able to choose and do what is right only because he lives in us and gives us the power to do so by his grace. He hasn't just forgiven us. He's taken up residence in us. And that there is real hope. Those are profound words for us to grasp. And when we struggle with living up to God's commands, we need to realize we need his grace to do so. We need his help daily to live according to his ways. We need God's strength and wisdom. We can't do it on our own. Today we look at Romans 12 verse 14, and it seems so contrary to what we naturally think, but because of the grace of God, because Jesus is in us, and because the Holy Spirit dwells in us, we're called to bless those who persecute you. Bless and don't curse them. Well, this is the opposite of our culture. Culture tells us to love those who love us and hate those who hate us. You see, vengeance is everywhere. Just look at some of the comments on Twitter and Facebook when someone disagrees with someone else. You see, we live in a rise up and take matters into our own hands kind of world. And we respond to evil with evil. Do you remember Peter's reaction to the Roman authorities who came to arrest Jesus in the Garden of Gethsemane? Peter took out his sword and cut off the ear of the soldier he believed might was right, and he took matters into his own hands. He wanted to destroy his enemies. That's what our heart gravitates to naturally. If someone wrongs us, we want to do something about it. If we get cut off in our car by another driver, we respond with road rage. We sound the horn, and we say in our heart, I'll show them. I won't let them get away with that. When we are betrayed or hurt by others, we often plot our revenge. We fantasize about what we would do if we had the chance. When we think or act this way, we've allowed evil to mold our thinking. When we plot our revenge, when we dream about a way to take matters into our own hands, we've been molded by the world instead of God's grace. But Jesus living in us gives us a new model to follow and a new way to respond. Now you may say that to yourself that being a persecuted is not something you experience here in the United States. And that is true when compared to the hostility that many Christians face outside of this country. I'd also say that it is because of the spread of Christianity in this country that we are so free to worship God. Let me share some reports about what's happening in our world today. This past week in Nigeria, there has been horrendous persecution towards followers of Jesus during Christmas week of all weeks. I don't know if you're aware of it, but in Nigeria, there has been a Christian genocide. In the past 10 years, almost 35,000 Christians have been murdered. In 2019, reports tell us that 2,200 Christians died that year. Last week, a pastor was taken from his home and held for ransom, but was then hacked to death with a machete. On December 21st, a hundred armed men came into a village and abducted the pastor of a Baptist church and killed eight people. On December 17th, 10 people were killed and 18 homes were burnt down during an attack by armed men. 
Islamic militants continue to abduct Christian boys and girls and try to force them to convert to Islam. And if they don't, they're either turned into sex slaves or murdered. Just going to church can lead to your death in Nigeria. And the sitting government is doing nothing to stop it. We need to be praying for the Christian church in Nigeria as they face great persecution. May the Lord give them great grace to face their enemies. When we hear these reports, we have within us the natural tendency to pay back evil with evil, to seek revenge and to retaliate. We want to do to them what they've done to us. But Jesus calls us to a new way of life that can only be accomplished by his amazing grace. His grace transforms us to follow what is the good and acceptable and perfect will of God. He calls us to walk a very different path. Here's the way that Jesus wants us to respond. He said it in Luke chapter 6. Listen to his words. But I say to you who hear, love your enemies. Do good to those who hate you. Bless those who curse you and pray for those who abuse you. To one who strikes you on the cheek, offer the other also. And from one who takes your cloak, do not withhold your tunic either. Give to everyone who begs from you, and from one who takes away your goods, do not demand them back. And as you wish that others would do to you, do so to them. If you love those who love you, what benefit is that to you? For even sinners love those who love them. And if you do good to those who do good to you, what benefit is that to you? For even sinners do the same. And if you lend to those from whom you expect to receive, what credit is that to you? Even sinners lend to sinners to get back to the same amount. But love your enemies and do good and lend, expecting nothing in return, and your reward will be great. And you will be sons of the Most High, for He is kind to the ungrateful and the evil. So be merciful even as your Father is merciful. How is that possible? How can we love our enemies? How can we bless our persecutors? In a world full of retaliation and revenge and hatred, our only hope is the grace of God. It's the grace of God that changes our behaviors. The indwelling power of the Holy Spirit shapes and molds our behaviors to mimic Christ. And the Holy Spirit enables us to be more like Jesus day by day. He enables us to bless those who persecute you. And Jesus living in us enables us to meet hatred with love and forgiveness. On the cross, Jesus prayed for the very ones who put him there. He prayed for his enemies, and he showed them love when he was the victim of their hatred. And he cried out to God, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. Jesus was despised and rejected by man, but the cross became the symbol of his love for mankind. And when we love and forgive others, when we, they persecute us and hate us, we show the world what God is like. The Greek word in verse 14 for bless is a word that means to ask God to show favor to them. When we're persecuted, when we face hostility for being a follower of Jesus, we're to ask God to show favor toward our enemy. We're to sincerely love them. We pray for them and our prayers are a way of showing mercy to them. This is exactly what Jesus did on the cross. He asked his father to forgive them. We are just like Jesus when we forgive our enemy. And the reality is this, is that if we follow Jesus, we can expect to have enemies. People will hate us for following Jesus. Paul told the church in Ephesus that all who desire to live a godly life in Christ Jesus will be persecuted. And Jesus said the world will revile us and utter all kinds of evil against us because we belong to him. An attorney for a religious liberty law firm has just written a book about the decline of religious liberty in the United States. He said, for the first time in American history, common Christian beliefs are viewed as incompatible with prevailing culture. So as followers of Jesus here in America, we're finding much more animosity and hatred. Many have been questioning if a, a Christian is suitable for the office of president or a Supreme Court justice. Just last week, a Christian pop star named Lauren Daigle was removed from the line of Dick Clark's New Year's Rocking Eve on ABC because the mayor of New Orleans called her participation in an outdoor worship concert as harmful. The mayor said she harmed our people, she risked the lives of our residents, and she st or strained our first responders in a way that is unconscionable in the midst of a public health crisis. This is not who we are and she cannot be allowed to represent New Orleans or the people she willfully endangered. 
Those were the words of the mayor. Well, protests much larger had been permitted in the city, but to gather for worship is seen as unconscionable. Many have responded saying that this was a blatant attempt by the mayor to persecute Lauren Daigle for her faith. Well, for some of us, we have or will experience persecution or hostility in the workplace. By following Jesus, you may not get the prom promotion that you were hoping for. Following Jesus on the campus, on college campuses, will cause you to be rejected by many and ostracized by your peers. Christian professors find it harder to be granted tenure and often find that their faith in Christ will keep them from becoming the head of the department. And following Jesus as a teacher in the public school system will also cause hostility. By being a follower of Jesus, we'll be alienated from many in this world. We'll even be hated, but this is when we can cherish the grace of God. As followers of Jesus, we find our true satisfaction in Christ rather than our satisfaction through our acceptance by the world. And because of Jesus, we no longer crave satisfaction through vengeance or retaliation. And when we put our trust in God, we find him to be our all-satisfying treasure. We'll find our strength and wisdom in him alone. We realize that we get God. When we have God on our side, we have everything we need, and God calls us to walk a different path. Well, a young Korean man became a Christian during World War II, and he entered a Presbyterian seminary in Seoul, Korea after the war, and then the communists invaded the southern part of Korea. Uh, Korea. It was the beginning of the Korean War. The young Christian fled with his wife to an island where his parents lived, but the communists invaded that island shortly thereafter. He and his family were in hiding for most of the time that they were there, and he was arrested in October 1950. And he was taken to a mass grave where many Christians had been put to death already. And he was asked to make false charges against the American missionaries in the area. And he was told to deny his faith in Jesus Christ. And he refused. And he thought he was going to die. But he was released and allowed to go home. Well, in the middle of the night, they came for him again. This time they took his wife and father with them as well. And they were brought before a mob of people, and they cheered as the communist soldiers beat them before the watching mob. His father died first as he cried out for mercy for his son, and then his wife died next, and she said, I will see you in heaven shortly. And his beating left him unconscious, and they thought he was dead. Well, in the early hours of the morning, he regained consciousness and was able to escape. And he made his way to a friend's home, but his friend turned him into the enemy. And they were about to throw him over a cliff and into the sea. But another group of people came along and begged them not to kill him. And they cried out that all he has done was teach us what is good. At the same time, the South Korean army began to invade the island to take it back from the communists. In all the confusion, they left this pastor alive and went to fight the South Koreans. Twenty days later, the South Koreans captured the communists, including the ones who killed this man's father and wife. A trial was convened, and they were found guilty, and were preparing to execute them for their crimes, but Pastor Kim asked the court to show mercy. He asked them to be spared. The South Korean commander asked, why do you want them to live? And Pastor Kim replied, because the Lord to whom I belong would have me show mercy. The communists were set free. But the whole island heard the story, and many of the liberated communists came to hear him preach, and they received Jesus Christ. This is what's possible, and it's no longer I who live, but Christ lives in me. Jesus empowers us to love our enemies, to bless those who hate us and, to pers and persecute us. And when we do, when we show God to the world by the way we live, he is on display. We bring glory to God when we are merciful. Our new position in Christ will put us at odds with people and institutions, but it will lead to great blessing. Jesus said, Blessed are those who are persecuted for righteousness' sake, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are you when others revile you and persecute you and utter all kinds of evil against you falsely on my account. May we be encouraged to boldly live for Christ and God's glory. Let's pray. Oh, Heavenly Father, we thank you that as we gather today on this first Sunday of the new year, we are reminded of what your grace can do in us. 
And we are reminded of how futile it is for us to live by our own strength and own power. But we thank you now for the grace that has swamped us, the grace that pervades our life. And we thank you that you now dwell in us and have taken up residence within our hearts so that we are able to be transformed by the renewing of our minds according to your patterns and your ways in this world so that it would even play out in how we love our enemies. Lord, we know that there are many experiencing great persecution throughout the world. We thank you that they have remained strong and have been a strong testimony of your grace in their lives, even as they've faced death. And Lord, we must thank you for the great ease and freedom that we have had in this country. Would you allow us and teach us to use it for your good, for the building up of your kingdom? As long as we have this freedom, would we continue to proclaim the good news that is found in your Son, Jesus Christ? And Lord, I pray that you would give us hope, hope in the midst of vengeance and retribution. And would you enable us to live a different way so that Christ would be seen in us? In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Well, we gather today also for the Lord's Supper, an opportunity for us to gather around this table. And this table is a reminder of the mercy and grace of God. For in it, he paid the price for us, his enemies, and Jesus would die in, in our place. And he would take our sin and he would nail it to the cross once and for all. And this is what the table reminds us. This is what the Lord's Supper celebrates. Is the newfound grace that we have, the mercy of God now showered upon us. And so it obviously would now make us shower mercy upon other people. So as we gather around the table this morning, we, we rejoice in what Jesus Christ has accomplished for us. So let's pray as we begin. Oh, Heavenly Father, we thank you now that this table has been prepared for us by the work of your Son. And we celebrate it now and until he comes again reminding ourselves of what we have tasted and seen in your goodness and grace toward us. And we long for that day when these things would be replaced with the real thing, with Christ's presence right in our midst. But in the meantime, we thank you that you've offered this as a means of grace for us today, to give us strength and encouragement for our day's journey and for following you. So we ask now that you would take a, these elements, these human elements, and set them aside for their spiritual use in us. We thank you for the bread of Christ. We thank you for the blood of Christ that covered over us so that we'd be made right with you. We ask now that you would use this time for your purposes and for our enrichment of our souls and for your glory. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. On the night that Jesus was betrayed, he took the bread and he broke it and he said, this is my body which is given for you. And then he also took the cup. The cup was the third cup of the Passover meal. And it was a reminder of the cup of redemption. And he said, as often as you drink this, do this in remembrance of me. It's the new covenant that is made in my blood. And as often as you drink and as often as you eat, we remember God's mercy for us. So as you participate today, may the Lord remind you of these things. And may he be the center. And may you taste and see the goodness of God's grace. Take and eat to the glory of the Lord. And come out of sadness from wherever you've been. Come broken hearted, let rescue begin. Come find your mercy, O oh sinner, come kneel. Earth has no sorrow, the heaven can. So lay down your burdens, lay down your shame. All who are broken, lift up your face. Wanderer, come home, you're not too far. Lay down your heart, lay down your heart, come as you are. There's hope for the hopeless and all those who strain. 
sit at the table, come taste the grace There's rest for weary, the rest that endures Earth has no sorrow, the heaven can cure Oh, earth has no sorrow, that heaven can cure So lay up your face, a wanderer come home, you're not too far, so lay down your heart, lay down your heart, and come as you are, come as you Sinner, be still. Earth has no sorrow that heaven can heal. Oh, earth has no sorrow that heaven can heal. Lay down your burdens. Lay down your shame. Oh, who are of your face a wanderer come home you're not too far so lay down your hurt lay down your heart and come as you are oh come as you We begin a new year this week and I want to encourage you to take time with God uh, and make it a regular habit of your day. We do a lot of things that we don't need to do over the course of the day and there are many things that we neglect to do each day. Well, let God be a priority for you this year. Take time to work through a devotional or take time to study portion of God's Word and read your Bible daily and spend time in prayer. These are gifts God has given to us to help us daily. Seek his strength and seek his wisdom and power for you. I love that verse we mentioned today many times. Galatians 2.20 It is no longer I who live, but Christ lives in me. It is so simple to memorize this verse, so I would encourage you to do so. And may your love for God fuel your devotion for him. Thanks for being with us today, and we will continue our series next week on bold faith as we look at what it means to rejoice with those who rejoice and weep with those who weep. Followers of Christ are called to have a compassion for others. So let's learn how to display the love of Christ through compassion for people. Remember, God's grace is sufficient enough for you to accomplish all that he calls you to do. So see you next week. May the Lord bless you.